Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Today we're going to be looking at the ECG. Now, during the course of this week, as it's going to be ECG week on the channel, we'll be looking at a lot of these review lecture videos. And by the end of this, these lecture videos, by the end of the week, you should be able to interpret an ECG and you should actually have a good understanding because this is one of the most important tools especially when you go to the cardiology department now how do we get you from understanding these squiggly lines over here because most students actually see an ecg and it absolutely looks daunting and it leaves everyone confused as in what am i looking at what are these figures over here what are these numbers over here what are these what what does all this mean so there's a lot of confusion that is among many medical students straight from first year up until even final year students and no one really seems to say what they should look for on the ECG and no one really gives a clear indication and a clear picture and someone could literally go through the entire medical school and not really know how to read an ECG but it's actually a very simple thing so how do we get you from being so confused to actually being an expert of mastering an ECG that's why the these lecture videos are very important and before we actually go into any further details let's first set the ground rules first of all if you're not subscribed to the channel please subscribe to the channel drop a like drop a comment and please share the channel share the video it might help someone else that's in dear need and the second thing that's going to be there because they're going to be a series of lecture videos please make sure you watch them in order do not skip any video watch all of them in order because they build up on every principle that we talk about in the prior lecture that you're going to be needing in the subsequent lecture so if you miss out one principle it makes it very hard for you to follow and often that's one mistake that most students make they assume that they already know the basics and then they skip the basics and go straight into the advanced level stuff and end up being confused you end up being frustrated and you spend so many hours looking at the ECG that you can't really even understand. So why is this different from any other video online? Well, I've watched a lot of ECG videos online and I could put them in two categories. One category are those videos that give you just the basics, as in they make ECG look so simple and so plain that when you are watching the video you have this notion that you're understanding everything and then when you're on the words and you're given an ecg boom you have no idea what you're looking at or you it's kind of like you're thrown into the deep end think of it like you're swimming in a shallow end and then someone says oh yeah let's take you to an olympic pool and they throw you in an olympic pool and you can't even swim that's one group of videos the other group of videos are the ones that give you way too much details too quickly and before you know it you are even confused as in what you are looking at what you're studying if you're studying to become a master at cardiology ecgs i don't know so most videos either fall under giving you too many basics or not giving you um enough basics or giving you way too much detail such that you end up feeling lost and you don't even follow what the guy is saying on the video or it could be a female let me not be um, gender biased so these videos are pretty much going to be giving you what you need as a medical student what you need as a newly graduated doctor what you need to understand about reading an ecg so that's why these videos are pretty much very important so the series is going to be broken down into pretty much 10 parts because we cannot discuss everything in one lecture video it's going to be super boring and it's going to be super confusing that's why i've broken it down into parts where we can discuss certain things on certain days and by the end of the lectures then i shall give you a, an online quiz that you can take i shall uh, send a link or i shall create a google form and please take the link and we shall post the results uh, pretty much like a week later given 
how how many people actually take the quiz so please subscribe uh, drop a like on the video drop a comment and um, drop any suggestions of any ECG experiences that you've had on the words please let's share the experiences together and at least encourage one another so there are going to be pretty much 10 parts to this lecture video part one is going to be pretty much the introduction to the ECG please do not skip this lecture it is very important because it's going to introduce you to all the basics that you need to interpret an ECG most people often just jump into an ECG and how to interpret it minus them knowing how exactly it comes about why is it that you have 12 of those things on the paper then and the second part will be pretty much interpretation of the ECG in part two we'll look at the basics of the ECG the basic waveforms the basic patterns of the ECG then part three that's when we'll actually start at looking at the systematic approach of interpreting the ECG and the different parts of the ECG then uh, part four and five will pretty much look at conduction problems so we'll look at heart block first degree heart block second degree heart block second degree has two types morbids type one morbids type two then third degree heart block we'll also look at um, the block of the anterior and uh, the posterior um, bundle branches as well as um, something you call that hemifascular block then we'll go on and look at the rhythm of the heart and look at arrhythmias tachy arrhythmias bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmias and how are they are uh, seen on ECG uh, atrial arrhythmias junctional arrhythmias even ventricular arrhythmias as well as other conditions then we'll look at um, abnormalities of the P wave we'll look at abnormalities of the QRS complex we'll look at abnormalities of the T wave then under your reminder is over here I shall give you the important highlights and the important things that you should take away from these ECG lecture series so by the end of these review lectures you should be a master at actually how to interpret an ECG and of course we shall create a Google link form um, or a Google test that you should take as part of the subscribers and we shall an announce the person that has the highest score at the end of the video when we post the answers so big shout out to this man right here who caused us so much problem and a big thank you sir for all your troubles so this guy over here is known as the father of ECG so um, his name is Willem Enthoven now this Willem Enthoven is the one who actually discovered the different waves that we use on an ECG and how exactly they chose the letters it was actually pretty much at random so it could have been A B C D E it could have been E F G H but they, they chose to start at P for whatever reason so he's the one who discovered those ECG ECG waves which we now call the P, the Q, the R, the S and the T waves. He also discovered the positions where you could actually place the ECG leads. We'll talk about what ECG leads are. So you could place them at the right arm, you could place them at the left arm, you could place them at the left leg. And also don't forget that when you look at electricity, you have a live, you have an earthing and you have a neutral. So you can think of the right leg as the neutral or as the electrical ground in this case. So if you look at these three points, the right arm, the left arm and the left leg, they create a triangle with the heart right in the middle of the triangle just there. So you call this triangle as, as Ethoven's triangle, Ethoven's triangle. That's why this guy was considered as um, the father of ECG. So big shout out to him. So what do we call it? Do we call it an ECG? Do we call it an EKG? Well, they pretty much mean the same thing. So in some countries I refer to as an EKG. In other countries you refer to them as an ECG, but they both mean that you are pretty much carrying out electrocardiography or you will have an electrocardiogram. So this is just simply a depiction a picture showing the electrical activity of the heart and remember that most actually ECG abnormalities if you use reasoning to work through them the reasoning is very sound and it's very easy for you to follow it's very easy to pick up abnormalities if you have a systematic way and you use reasoning but always remember that we do not treat ECGs we treat patients so in some cases you may get a normal ECG reading but the patient doesn't look okay. So please treat the patient 
don't treat the ECG. And remember that most of your diagnosis are going to largely hang on the history. Most patients, the answer is always in the history. The additional things like the physical examination just support the diagnosis. Even the ECG is used to support the diagnosis and also give you some clues as to how you're going to manage this patient. So please treat the ECG, I mean treat the patient, not the ECG. So what is this electrocardiograph? So this is just going to be pretty much these series of waves and deflections that are going to be recorded because the heart has electricity um, on it. So when you look at the ECG, if we can think of it like we're taking an electrical picture of how the heart is working. So the different leads that we connect to the ECG, you can think of the leads as the different views that we have of the heart. And remember that most of the heart, the bulk majority of the heart is with the ventricles and most of the problems are happening with the ventricles. So most of the leads are going to be looking at the ventricles because you have most of the muscle being in the ventricles. And if there's a problem with the atrium, they may not be much of a problem maybe in a few selective conditions that's where you may actually see some problems but in majority of ventricular problems that's where you see significant debilitation to the patient so what are some of the indications for us going to be ordering an ecg we can think of cardiac indications we can think of extra cardiac indications so someone could come in with an acute coronary disease it could be an st uh, segment elevation myocardial infarction which we call a STEMI or it could be a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, which we call an n So because, the, because we are able to actually determine whether this is a STEMI or an n it has a bearing on the management. So please get an ECG. Rule of thumb is this. Anyone that comes in with a chest pathology, I always tell my students this. Everyone that comes in with a chest pathology, make sure you at least get an X-ray, make sure you at least get an ECG, and make sure you at least get an echo. Then if someone has ectopic beats, if someone has arrhythmias or even any conduction abnormalities, then please get an ECG. If someone comes in with palpitations, get an ECG. If someone comes in with pericarditis or if they have an implanted defibrillator or a pacemaker that may be malfunctioning, please get an ECG. Then some extra cardiac um, causes could be any chest pain or chest discomfort, any shortness of breath. If someone has fainted or has come close to fainting, please get an ECG. If someone has a suspected diabetic ketoacidosis, please get an ECG. If there are any metabolic derangements, it could be hyperkalemia, it could be hypokalemia, we'll talk of them, please get an ECG. If there are any drug toxicities in all unconscious patients, when they come in comatose, please get an ECG because there could be something wrong with your heart. But of course, please do your ABCs. You don't want to start getting an ECG on someone who's not breathing. So make sure that the person is alive first and stabilize the person, then get an ECG. So there is pretty much no absolute contraindication for us getting the ECG unless the patient refuses the ECG because we live in a world of de democracy, apparently. So you don't want to force any test on anyone but some patients actually do have some allergies or sensitivities to the adhesive that is used to um, attach the suction cups to the chest or to attach the leads to the chest some people may um, have these things so in such a case use a hypoallergenic alternative uh, that may be available on the market so let's give you an anatomical background um, so that you are able to understand what we're getting into. So remember that the heart is going to be consisting of two types of muscles. They are what are known as cardiac conducting cells or cardiac conducting muscles. These are pretty much going to be generating the impulse and carrying the impulse along the heart so that the heart can contract. Then you have the cardiac contracting cells, which are going to be contracting and generating the force that is pushing the blood. They're going to make up the bulk majority of the atrium. They're going to make up the bulk majority of the ventricle. Now, these cardiac conducting cells have a property of automaticity, meaning that they are able to generate their own impulse. So they include tissues like the SA node, which is found in the right atrium. This SA node generates the impulse and generates the heart rate. 
Then you have the internodal tracts. There are three predominant internodal tracts. There is what is known as the tract of Bachmann, the tract of Wenkback, and the tract of Thoreau. These sound like superheroes to me. So you have the tract of Bachmann, tract of Wenkback, and tract of uh, Thoreau, which are like internodal tracts. And these are going to be causing the atria to contract and then you have the av node which is between the atrium and the ventricle you have a common bundle branch or a bundle of his that divides into a right and a left bundle branch but remember that the left ventricle is much larger than the right ventricle so it makes no um, it makes sense to think that the left bundle branch is going to be divided into uh, two other branches an anterior division and a posterior division or an anterior branch and a posterior branch then of course you have the Purkinje fibers so these are the conducting systems and they have the pop property of automaticity like I told you meaning that they're going to be generating the impulse and most of the impulses are going to be generated from the SA node now why do you think this is so If you say that because the SA node fires the fastest, then you're correct. Think of it like this. If you're arguing with someone who talks really quick, it will always seem like as if you're losing. Even though you may be saying the most intellectual of things, it will always seem like you are losing. So remember that um, we can think of the heart as having four chambers anatomically, but at an ECG standpoint, please let's think of the heart as having only two chambers. Atria, which are going to be contracting as one, and ventricles, which are going to be contracting as one. And remember, for the contraction to happen, there has to be a depolarization. And if you recall from your action potentials that you covered in physiology, the depolarization simply just means the movement, the inward movement of a positive ion, in essence. So in this case, it could be sodium, it could be calcium, that's going to be causing um, the resting cell, the, the resting membrane potential to become less negative and need to become positive. Okay, so any depolarization is going to lead to a contraction, and depolarization it will mean the inward flow of a positive ions. Please keep this in mind because when you put an electrode over a, a, a distance and this positive ion is flowing towards that electrode it would cause a positive deflection or it would cause this electrode to record a positive value that's how you get those deflections and that's how you get those waves on the ECG so remember that um, the pathway of the impulse is usually going to start off in the SA node Okay, so that's where the cardiac cycle is going to be normally starting in the right atrium. So the SA node is going to depolarize and then this uh, SA node is going to spread over the muscles of the, of the atrium and cause the atrium to contract. Now, the reason why these muscles contract as a whole is because they are a syncytium. A syncytium is simply the, they are connected to each other through these special channels in between them that are known as gap junctions. These gap junctions allow certain ions to move from one myocardial cell to another myocardial cell. And remember, before the impulse gets to the AV node, there's a bit of a delay that happens. This delay allows blood to actually move from the atrium to the ventricles before the ventricles contract. And the delay is roughly somewhere about 0.12 seconds to about 0.20 seconds. So that delay or that time is what is we're going to be judging as the PR interval on your ECG. And after now you depolarize this AV node, there's going to be some electrical discharge that's going to be traveling down the bundle of his in, that's found in the septum between the ventricles, the, both the left and the right ventricle. Then the left bundle branch is going to divide into two, like I told you, an anterior branch and a posterior branch. Then, of course, in the ventricles, the, the conduction is going to be spreading much slower through the Purkinje fibers. So here's a depiction of what I've been talking you, to you about. This is your right atrium. This is your left atrium. This is your right ventricle. This is your left ventricle over there. You can see that the left ventricle, the muscle is much 
larger than the right ventricle. So the impulse is starting off in the SA node, spreading over into the internodal tracts, depolarizing the atrium, eventually reaches the AV node, then is conducted down the bundle of his, and then into the right and left bundle branches. The left bundle branch divides into an anterior and a posterior branch. So please keep that in mind. And if the impulse starts off from the SA node, has the normal timings and has the normal delays, you refer to that as normal sinus rhythm. So when you look at an ECG and they tell you that this ECG has normal sinus rhythm, it means that number one, the impulse was generated at the SA node. Number two, the impulse traveled along the normal tissues of the conduction system. Number three, the impulse had the normal timings and the normal delay. And number four, the rate at which this impulse was flowing was normal. So roughly between 60 to 100 beats per minute. So that's what you refer to as the sinus rhythm. So these, remember that there is a normal electrical act activation of the heart, which is going to be beginning in the SA node. So when you say the word rhythm, you refer to the part of the heart which is contract which is controlling the activation of the sequence, which is pretty much the SA node. So if you're starting off from the SA node and following the right paths, then you call that as sinus rhythm. Then how exactly do we record this ECG? I know this lecture may be getting super boring for some of you because some of these principles, you may have already known them, but I'm making sure that I leave no one behind and I'm covering every single base and I'm covering every single detail. So please just hang in there. It'll get a bit interesting when we go to how to actually interpret the ECG and we'll look at certain pathologies. So we can think of the ECG leads as pieces of wire that we're going to be connecting to the patient in order for us to actually record what is happening and get an electrical picture of the heart. Remember that this electrical activity of the heart is going to be detected on the surface of the body. And you're going to be having these five electrodes or these five leads which are joined to an ECG recorder that has wires. And remember that we can connect these electrodes to each limb we, and we can connect some of them to the chest through suction cups. So, and we'll move them at different locations of the chest. We shall, I shall show you where you actually connect these ECG leads to the chest and to the limbs. And we have to actually ensure that there's a good contact between the chest and the lead. So if the, the person has hair on the chest, please make sure that you shave the hair. Otherwise it's going to affect the interpretation of the ECG. Now, these leads can either be a bipolar or they can be unipolar. So the, the limb leads are also known as a bipolar leads. So the standard limb leads are bipolar, meaning that they have two electrodes, two electrodes of opposite polarity. So they'll have one electrode which is positive and another electrode which is either negative or a reference point. So you call that as a bipolar lead. Then the other leads just simply have a, sing a single positive electrode and of course a, a reference point. They do not have a, a, a negative point, they just have a reference point. So they are unipolar. So you have bipolar leads and you have unipolar leads. The bipolar leads are the standard limb leads. Then the unipolar leads, you have what is known as the augmented limb leads and what are known as the chest leads, the ones that you connect over the chest. So th each of these leads looks at the heart from a different point of view, from a different angle. So you can think of it as you wanna have a 360 degree view of the heart. So you connect the leads at different areas to give you a, a whole 360 picture of the heart and it's actually much more accurate to have um, looking at, to have us looking at the heart from different angles rather than us looking at it from a single perspective or from like a 1D type of thing, if I could say. So in most hospitals, we perform something that is known as a 12 lead ECG, which will have 12 views. So we have 12 views that are as a result of connecting um, 12 uh, electrodes to the, I mean, 10 electrodes to the body. So you have what are known as standard limb leads, which are of course lead one, lead two and lead three. And then we have 
augmented limb leads which are lead 4 which is also known as lead AVR they don't call it lead 4 so just remember lead AVR then you have lead 5 you don't refer to it as lead 5 you have AVL you have lead 6 which you call AVF and then you have the unipolar chest leads these are connected to the chest lead V1 V2 V3 V4 V5 and V6 then so for us to actually be able to interpret this 12 lead EKG or ECG you have to have a great understanding of the electrical activity of the heart so before we actually release the second video I would aim for you after you watch this video please go read up on the electrical activity of the conducting system in the heart remember that action potential that looks like an H which has a plateau on your um when you're doing your physiology as well as the electrical activity which has those squiggly lines for the conducting cells if this is greek to you please go revise the action potentials so remember that the direction of um in which the impulse is going to be flowing in the heart is very important okay so these 12 uh, ECG leads I shall keep emphasizing this point these 12 ECG leads are going to pick up these impulses as they are traveling in the many directions because remember the impulse is starting off in the chest in the right atrium which is most close to the right side of the body then traveling down to the left ventricle so you can think of it as traveling towards the apex which is uh, pretty much the fifth intercostal space mid clavicular line so when you have these leads was simply connecting uh, two points at the body you have one point which is a positive another point which is a negative so you have two leads you have a lead that is going to be a reference point the lead that is the reference point or the point that is fixed you refer to that as the negative lead then you have the lead which is exploring which usually changes you call that as the positive lead so if you have an impulse flowing between these two leads the positive and the negative if it's flowing towards the positive electrode it will give you a positive deflection it will give you an upward deflection on your galvanometer on your ecg and it will be an upward deflection on the ecg paper if it's flowing away from the positive electrode it's going to give you a negative deflection on an ecg paper and sometimes in some leads the reference point may actually be a combination of two or even three electrodes so pay note close attention to that this may not make sense right now but i'll show you some pictures that will actually open your mind and you understand and you'll be like oh that is what he was talking about so very very shortly you shall have that all moment so if this depolarization current is flowing towards the lead then it's going to give you a positive deflection if it's flowing away from the positive lead it will give you a negative deflection so this is the picture that i was telling you about suppose we have your uh, reference electrode over here your negative electrode over here and your positive electrode over here so if the impulse which is our call our vector quote unquote is flowing towards this uh, exploring electrode or the positive electrode you get a positive deflection on the ECG if you have this um, vector or this impulse flowing away from this electrode then you get a negative deflection on the ECG that is what I was referring to so for example in lead AVR because AVR will be placed somewhere here and remember the impulse is starting off from here in the right atrium spreading in that direction and moving away from the heart like moving away from the right atrium so it means that this lead which has the positive electrode there lead AVR it will have these impulses moving away from it so it would mean that all the waves on the AVR will be inverted so it means that they'll be upside down quote unquote so there's a normal um, frontal plane axis of how the impulse is going to be flowing like I told you this is the heart so remember it's like this heart or this space this person's heart is facing you so it's like a person is standing in anatomical position and they're directly facing you so what would be on the right is what's on your left what is on the left is what's on your right what is superior remains superior what is inferior remains inferior remember that the electrical activity of the heart is starting off in the right atrium like that and then it'll be flowing to the to the other atrium 
and then eventually flowing through the ventricle so it's in this direction like i told you over there so if you were to put a clock here so you would have your 12 o'clock there your six o'clock there your five o'clock there three o'clock so it's like the impulse is flowing in that direction okay so from like 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So we shall call this flow of impulse from 11 o'clock to like 5 o'clock as your cardiac axis. So keep that in mind because we shall mention cardiac axis when you look at interpretation of an ECG. So, so that means that we have pretty much um, these electrodes or these limbs that actually help us detect the flow of current in different planes. So you have what are known as the limb leads, lead one, lead two, lead three, lead AVF, lead AVR, and lead AVL. These are going to be having uh, an exploring electrode and a reference point that is placed in the frontal plane of the heart. So we shall draw some graphs for you and I shall show you how to interpret those things. So please just take a chill pill. Then you have this, these leads are very um, important for actually detecting any vectors that are flowing in the frontal plane. Then of course you have the chest leads, which is V1 up to V6. These are going to be having the exploring electrode that is placed anteriorly to the chest. And the reference point is actually inside the chest. It's not outside the chest, but inside the chest. So it means that it's perpendicular to the body. So it, you, you're having kind of like... Um, a horizontal plane on the other hand this one was a vertical i mean was a frontal plane or a vertical plane then on the chest leads this is a horizontal plane so let me show you a picture of what i mean so as you can see here you have the electrode on on the head and on the foot like that this is in the frontal plane so it's like yeah you haven't even penetrated the body then you have this horizontal plane where the the electrode is the inside the body and the other the reference point is inside the body then the electrode is on the surface of the body kind of like a horizontal plane so these are the two planes that we have that enable us to actually have a 360 view of the heart the frontal plane which are pretty much the limb leads the lead one lead two lead three lead avl lead avf and lead avr and you have the horizontal plane leads that's leads v1 to v6 which are your chest leads so we we'll start talking about the standard limb leads or the bipolar leads. So these are going to be consisting of two electrodes of opposite polarity. So they're going to be having a negative electrode and a positive electrode. And of course, there'll be a ground electrode, but we'll forget about the ground electrode. If you are an ECG technician, then this is very important for you to know how to connect to these things and calibrate your ECG machine. But we're not going to go into much detail of that because this ECG lecture is more or less helping students understand how to interpret an ECG. So you have these two electrodes, which, which are of opposite polarity, a negative electrode and a positive electrode. There's going to be a lead one, lead two and lead three. So these standard limb leads are going to be connected to the right arm, to the left arm and to the left leg. So you can either connect them here, which is common. So the right wrist or the left wrist here the left leg and the right leg or you can connect them to the thigh or you can connect them to the shoulder whichever apparatus that you have they still give you the same or similar type of reading then the augmented limb leads are also connected in these the same positions that i have told you about so lead one so how do we connect lead one lead one simply you have the right um arm having the negative electrode the left arm having the positive electrode so it's like the vector is in this plane here okay so it means that in this lead one you're simply going to be looking at the left because remember that the impulse is now flowing from um this point of the of the heart in that direction of the heart if you follow my cursor on the screen so it means that you're going to with this lead you're going to be looking at the left lateral view of the heart this is very important because if there's a pathology in lead one it means that it's most likely going to be at the left lateral ventricle or the left lateral ventricle ventricular aspect of the heart then of course you have lead two where the positive electrode is going to be connected to the left leg and the negative electrode is going to be connected to the right arm so we keep the negative electrode at the right arm so this is means that the impulse is going to be flowing in that direction like that so it's kind of like you're looking so you can think of it like this where the positive electrode is that's where you're looking at the heart so you can think of 
um, this is looking at the inferior left lateral view of the heart. And then your lead three, you have your positive electrode that's going to be um, connected to the left leg, while the negative electrode is going to be connected to the left arm. I don't know why I didn't add a picture of this. Apologies. So this is going to be giving you um, an inferior uh, view of the heart. So more or less like a, a right lateral view of the heart inferiorly. So if we connect those three lines or those three axes, we have this diagram. Lead one, which was viewing on this side so you have the positive electrode here the negative electrode there then lead two which had the positive electrode here the negative electrode there and lead three which had the positive electrode there and the negative electrode there so you can think of it like here that's where you have your eye here you have your eye here you have the eye quote unquote eye as in looking at the different areas or the different aspects of the heart then you have the augmented limb leads which are pretty much a single positive electrode that has a reference point or a zero point which is obviously in the center of the heart within the thoracic cavity so you have avf avl and avr so this avf just stands for augmented vector foot augmented vector um the left uh, augmented vector right okay so your augmented vector right or AVR, so the positive electrode is connected to the right arm. So it's kind of like you're just looking at the right lateral um, surface or the light, right lateral uh, aspect of the heart. Okay. Now with AVR, most ECG machines actually invert this AVR. They actually put it at the opposite direction here where they call it as an inverted AVR lead because you shall see that this is important so that you can have a, like a continuous uh, pattern or a continuous flow of the different aspects of the heart. So keep that in mind that you can actually invert it. So I shall show you a picture at the end of this. Then your AVL is connected to the, so remember, um, AVR, the R standing for right, so you connect it to the right arm. Then AVL, you have the L standing for left, so you connect it to the left shoulder of the left arm. So this is going to be giving you also a lateral view of the heart. Then you have one that's connected to the foot, to the left foot, so AVF, so the F for foot. So this looks at the inferior view of the heart. I forgot to add that to the slides. This looks at the inferior view to the heart. So it's, you can think of it as going down the umbilicus like that, giving you the inferior view to the heart. So if we connect these three augmented limb leads, you have AVR like that in this position looking at the heart from there. You have AVL in this position looking at the heart from there. And you have AVF in this position looking at the heart like that. So if we combine both the standard limb leads and um, the augmented limb leads, we have this hexaaxial reference system that we see. As you can see, the heart is in this position in the center of this 360 circle. So you have this 360 degree uh, a frontal view of the heart. And remember, this person is anatomical position. So whatever is on their right is on the left. Whatever is on their left is on your right. What's superior will remain superior. What's inferior will remain superior. So we'll start with lead one. So we have our lead one over here, which is at zero degrees. So it's looking at the heart in that manner, like that. Then you have our lead two, which is at 60 degrees like that, as well as at one minus 120 looking at the heart in this manner then you have our lead three which is at positive 120 and minus 60 looking at the heart in that manner then of course you had lead avl which is at minus 30 and looking at the heart in that direction you had avr which is at minus 150 but i remember remember when i told you that you have a negative avr or an inverted avr which we place here at positive 30 degrees so that you have a continuous flow of these leads so you can have this minus avr like that but if you are uh, getting your information from avr lead and your ecg machine doesn't invert this so it will mean that on your ecg tracing all the waveforms are going to appear inverted the p wave is going to be appear appearing inverted on the avr lead so that appears normal but if your ecg machine converts this then it will appear just like the other waves on the other ecg leads then so you have your avr over there you have your avf here at 90 degrees and you have your avl at minus 90 so you have kind of like this 360 view of 
the heart in the frontal plane. So I hope this diagram makes perfect sense to you now and when you're going to look at it at any in any textbooks that's are going to be helping you on how to read an ECG. Then here's a summary, like I told you, lead AVL, lead one, lead, A, lead inverted AVR, lead two, lead AVF, and lead three. So this is, these are the connections where you connect the negative electrode and the positive electrode over there just to remind you. So take some time, please absorb this diagram in your mind so it will give you a good understanding of where exactly you're looking at, um, which aspect of the heart you're viewing the lead from. If you understand this, then you understand that if you get a pathology in lead one, then you're suspecting that this is where the pathology is on the heart. Then of course we have chest leads which are connected right over the chest. So these ones pretty much look at a much closer view of the heart in the horizontal plane. So you have lead V1 up to lead V6. So lead V1 is connected in the fourth intercostal space on the right of the sternum. Lead V2 is connected in the same place on the left of the sternum. So fourth intercostal space, left of the sternum. Then we'll skip lead 3 for now and come to lead 4. So lead 4 is going to be connected in the fifth intercostal space, the left of the midclavicular line. So where you palpate your apex beat, that's where you place lead 4. Then lead 3 is going to be placed halfway between lead 2 and lead 4. Then we'll go to lead 5. Lead 5 is going to be placed in the fifth intercostal um space the left anterior axillary line then lead six is going to be placed in the fifth intercostal space the left mid axillary line so you have this lead v1 up to v6 these are known as unipolar chest leads so it means that lead v1 and v2 are going to be giving you the septum of the heart then lead v3 and v4 will give you the anterior view of the left ventricle you lead v5 and lead v6 will give you the lateral view of the left ventricle then after you connect these leads and you actually start reading the ECG, you have the ECG paper that you need to understand. So the ECG is actually a graph. You have a Y axis and you have an X axis. So the Y axis is going to be representing the voltage. Of course, it's going to be measured in millivolts because the current is not so much. You're not um, Thor, neither are you Mr. Electric Man. I know if only we could generate that much electricity so and then the x-axis is on the horizontal plane um or the horizontal side and this is going to be measuring time in seconds so remember that on the ecg you have small boxes which are the thin lines and you have big boxes which are the big lines so if your definition of the video is on the low quality please i'd advise you to switch it up to high quality so that you can actually be able to distinguish the small boxes from the large boxes then remember that each small box is going to be um, having a dimension of one by one so it'll be one millimeter uh, in width one millimeter in length so it's going to be a perfect square so you have five small boxes that are going to make up a big box so it means two big boxes will be equal to uh, 10 small boxes so here's what i'm to to talking you about so you have a big box here all the thick lines i don't know if you can see the thick lines here so you have one thick line here then you count one two three four five this is one big box so we get one big box over there you have five squares going this side representing um the time in seconds you have five squares going upwards representing the um voltage in millivolts and each of this square is one millimeter now depending on the speed of the ecg if this ecg paper is moving at 25 millimeters per second then each of these small boxes here is going to be representing 0 0.04 seconds so it means that five small boxes it will represent 0 0.2 seconds please keep these things in mind I'll, I'll give you a slide later on that is going to represent this so that you can have this in mind and then moving upwards regardless of the speed each of the small boxes is going to be representing 0 0.1 millivolts so 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.4 0 0.5 so it means you have 10 small boxes will give you one millivolt so 10 small boxes is equals to two large boxes so please keep this in mind because we're building on these principles that are going to enable us to understand how exactly we read the ecg so 
when you calibrate the norm the ecg normally uh, like i told you the 10 small squares uh, if you're moving upwards they're going to represent one millivolt so each small square is one millimeter so each small box would be 0 0.1 um millivolts and the higher you get on your ecg tracing from the baseline it means that the higher the amplitude of the wave okay so the baseline is known as the isoelectric line where the current is neither positive nor it is negative and then of course the timing depends on the speed of the ecg paper generally standard ecg papers usually flow at 25 millimeters per second in most hospitals but you can sometimes get an ecg paper at 50 millimeters because um at 50 millimeters per second it gives you a better view of the waveforms and it's much more easier to read but of course you have to take notes usually they indicated at the bottom of the paper what uh speed this ecg was going at and in some cases you may um, record it at 10 millimeters per second if you want to get a really really long tracing so all modern ecg machines you can switch between these speeds either 25 50 or 10 so please pay attention to the bottom of the ecg because it will give you an indication at what uh, speed the paper is going at so please know these differences very well like your life dependent upon it because it does so one small box or one millimeter is going to be equal to 0 0.02 seconds if the paper is moving at 20 at 50 rather if it's moving at 50 millimeters per second so this is equal to 20 milliseconds then one large box if it's moving at this at a, a speed of um this was supposed to be 50 yeah if it's moving at a speed of 50 millimeters per second this is going to mean that one large box will be equal to 0 0.1 second then one small box if it's moving at 25 millimeters per second which is your standard ecg uh, speed is going to be equal to 0 0.04 seconds so 40 milliseconds and then if it's moving at 25 millimeters per second one large box is going to be equal to 0 0.2 seconds or 200 um, milliseconds so i want you to know these two bottom values here because that's what we'll be using in these ecg discussions so like i told you these are the different um speeds so here you have a 50 uh, millimeter per second ECG here you have a 25 millimeter per second ECG on your y-axis here you have the voltage in, in um, millivolts you have your time in seconds so one small box is going to be equal to um, 0 0.1 seconds in if it's moving at 15 millimeters per second and um, one large box is going to be equal to 0 0.2 seconds then on the other hand here one small box is equal to 0 0.04 um seconds then of course your large box is going to be equal to um 0 0.4 seconds i don't know if i've confused that but um i think the values are on your screen so remember that in summary what you should take away from this is that the 12 leads give you 12 different views of the heart so lead one lead avr and lead a AVL are going to be uh, what I refer to as lateral limb leads. So they look at the lateral surface of the left ventricle and um, they are lateral limb leads like I already said. And then lead 2, lead 3 and lead AVF look at the inferior surface of the heart. So these are going to be looking at the inferior surface of the left ventricle. These are known as inferior limb leads. And then lead V1 and V2 look at the right. Um, this is supposed to be uh, atrium. Also, they look at the right atrium as well as the ventricular septum um, or the right ventricle as well. Then lead V3 and V4 look at the anterior wall of the left ventricle. Lead V5 and lead V6 look at the anterior and the lateral walls of the left ventricle. So I guess now you understand how this comes about. So as you can see on this ECG paper, you have 25 millimeters per second here. So 10 millimeters of the boxes gives you one millivolt so the speed is it is that the speed is at 25 millimeters per second the voltage is at one millivolt is equals to 10 millimeters or 10 uh, small squares so you have lead one lead two lead three 
lead AVR, lead AVL, lead AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. Now these three strips at the bottom here are referred to as rhythm strips. So they got lead one here and put it here. They got lead two, put it there. They got lead V5, put it there. These are known as rhythm strips. And then of course you have other details here like your ventricular rate, your PR interval, but you can ignore these things for now. Then of course the details of the ECG. So this is exactly um, the different components of the ECG and in our lecture we're pretty much going to be looking at how now we interpret that diagram that I just showed you and make sense of that diagram. So thank you for spending your time to listen to this review lecture video on the introduction of the ECG. Uh, please like, subscribe, drop a like and drop a comment. Please share the page. Make sure that no one misses out ECG week because it's very important for all the medical students and all the healthcare practitioners to have a good understanding of how to read an ECG. Until next time, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Bye-bye.